I have been so excited about this for weeks. Um, every once in a while, you have the opportunity to introduce a friend, a mentor, and one of the smartest guys on the planet. And uh, that's the exact position that I'm in right now. I'm so beyond excited that I literally, um, I haven't used note cards the entire day, but with Roland here, I wrote some notes down because I know him as Roland, I know what he does, but I wanted to make sure that you guys understood the magnitude of who you're gonna hear from. So he's very unassuming, he's kinda chill, but I gotta tell you, you'll probably take more away from this next one than you have in a long time. So let me just tell you a tiny bit about Roland Frazier before we bring him up. And when we bring him up, I gotta say, he feeds off your energy. So trust me, uh, you guys are in for a treat. So Roland has over a thousand acquisitions and exits in businesses already under his belt. He has $12 billion in portfolio sales in just three short years with over a 38 company portfolio of ownership. He's been the principal in six different Inc. fastest growing 500 companies. He's been interviewed in um, Business Insider, Fast Company, Entrepreneur, Young Finance. He's been on every major TV channel. I tried to start writing the TV channels down and I just lost track, so I just, I literally wrote on here, so many TV channels can't keep track. He has an amazing podcast called Business Lunch where he's interviewed such people as Sarah Blakely, Sir Richard Branson, and even Alder Schwarzenegger. You guys are in for a massive treat. Take some notes. I'm telling you, he's gonna blow your minds. Will you guys please help me welcome my good friend, Mr. Rowling. Thank you for hanging out until this late in the day and, uh, and being away. Hey, nice to see you. And um, I'm very excited to uh, get a chance to share with you because these guys at, uh, at Wealth Accelerators are like, this is the nearest and dearest thing to my heart because one of the things that I think is a mistake that I see again and again that people make is that they focus on building income and they never really think about wealth. And when income is great, but usually income is a dancing bear situation. Now, I know you guys are focused on passive income, and passive income is fantastic. It still requires some management and some maintenance, um, but it also can help you with wealth. And so what I wanted to share with you when I was thinking about what to talk about was what are the most radical wealth accelerators that I've experienced that might be something that you can use? So, are you guys interested in hearing about Wealth Accelerators? I'm in the right place? Okay, all right, all right, good. So uh, let's talk about that. Just to give you a little bit of background on me, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, some people say I'm old, I say I'm just still learning. Uh, but uh, there have been five real big learning opportunities that I've seen through the decades. In the 80s, I was doing leverage buyouts. Uh, leverage buyout is where you use the debt, uh, or where you use debt against the assets of a company to pay for it where you don't have to come out of pocket with any money. And I saw these guys at firms like Kohlberg, Kravis, Kravis and Roberts uh, that were doing it. We ended up selling companies to those guys, but it was really cool. I was like, you can actually acquire a company without spending any money using the assets of the company to finance the acquisition. This is pretty cool. Then in the 90s, um, I got a chance to do a lot of workouts. So I was like, okay, so I know you can finance companies without having to spend any money or have any money. And um, there's other people who have already put a whole lot of effort into something, but they just made a couple of mistakes. Maybe there's some challenge with their model. Maybe there's some challenge with the people um, that they had that weren't like ready to do it. Or maybe there's a challenge with the offer. But you can make a little change in these companies. And then when you make that change, big things happen, and you're able to work out the challenges that existed before. So then going into the 2000s, there was the dot-com uh, bust, and everybody was afraid that the world was gonna end because of this thing called Y2K, and um, I had a chance to do a lot of turnarounds of companies there. So I'm like, okay, well you can also take a company and not have to go through all the hassles of creating 
everything to make it go, and then just turn it around because, again, they've just got a few things wrong. So many opportunities exist because people have just a few things wrong. And so you don't have to start everything from scratch. Then going into the 2010s, uh, real estate. So the great recession of 2007, 8, 9, some people say that's going to happen again. I don't think so. I'm very bullish on life and the economy, as I hope that you guys are. But I did these things called roll-ups, and uh, my buddy Marcus uh, Lamanis was just up here. He did a really great roll-up. He went out and bought a whole bunch of little camp campgrounds and created this giant company called Camping World. So another interesting concept. Now, I'm focused on acquiring companies using a combination of all these strategies with no money out of pocket. So if you're interested, I'll talk a little bit about acquiring things with no money out of pocket. But if you're just investors and you want to spend money to acquire things, you should probably just take a break. So is it something you're interested in, this we can acquire companies with no money out of pocket? Okay, all right, good. Okay, I just wanted to be sure, wanted to be sure. This, uh, this is something, by the way, that I've been doing for, as, as you can see, for a long time. And uh, in that time, in 24 different industries, I've been able to grow eight-figure, meaning 10 million or more companies, $700 million a year companies, and one that is currently doing a little over $4 billion. So the combined, uh, the combined portfolio across a whole bunch of different things. I like service businesses. I like businesses that don't have inventory. I like infrastructure companies. We just invested in a... Uh, crypto infrastructure company. I know the guys from Spartan were here earlier and super smart people. Uh, we invested in a crypto infrastructure company last year. We just exited it at a 9x on the money that we put into it. So tremendous opportunities. Um, I really like infrastructure plays just as something that you don't have to depend on the market so much as that you already know the market for these things exist. Um, so there's some of the companies I have. If you'd like to hold your camera up, uh, you can just basically focus on that little QR code and it will pull up my LinkedIn profile. Happy to connect with you guys on social. And um, I love talking business. I get to come out and do these things because my wife does not want to hear anything about business. She's like, will you please shut the hell up about business? And so this is great because you guys actually enjoy this stuff. Um, now I got a question for you. There was a research study that just came out last week from Charles Schwab and it said that to feel financially comfortable, most Americans feel like they need to have a $774,000 net worth. $774,000. So I wanna know, and not knowing what your net worth is, but how many of you currently feel financially comfortable? Okay, just a couple. Well, interestingly enough, to feel wealthy, the number was $2.2 million. $2.2 million which is, to me, surprisingly low given that the numbers just came out saying that inflation is running at the highest it has in 50 years, right? Was it 6.8? Is that what it came out? It was ridiculously high. It was either 6.6 .6 or 6.8. It just came out. Um, so all of the things that we have net worth-wise are worth less unless they are also going up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can, how we can structure that too. And here's the thing, that real estate is insanely expensive, and so do you feel comfortable investing in it? I don't know, right? You're shaking your head, it's like, but do I, am I gonna miss out and then it's gonna go way, way higher? But interest rates are gonna go up. The Fed has said as long as inflation's happening, they're gonna continue doing these 0.5 in interest rate increases, which means that fewer people can afford real estate, which means that it should make the price go down. But wait, there's not enough houses because Blackstone says there's 5.7 million houses that, are, that we're short right now, and you can't get the lumber and all the stuff to buy them, and the talent to build them doesn't exist. It's, it's like, what the heck do I do? I should buy Netflix. Oh, no, wait, it's down 70%. I should buy crypto. No, crap, that's down too, right? How do you know what to do? To me, you have to have a model, and you have to have a model that works kind of through any of the crazy economies that you might see. We haven't really seen something like we've got right now because there's so much craziness and employment is still working fine, right? It's like you can change jobs apparently an average 12% increase in your salary. And now the new logic is that you should change jobs every 18 months. My argument's gonna be you should never have one. And so we'll talk about that and how you can do that, <laughs> all right? So let's talk about some of these wealth accelerators. So. 
I want you to start by thinking about, well, where am I right now? And where do I want to be? Where am I right now and where do I want to be? And I'd really like for you to think about it, and I would encourage you to write it down so that you can take this, because Peter Drucker said, what gets measured gets managed. If you are not measuring your net worth regularly, not obsessively checking your stock portfolio or your crypto investments, right? But if you are not really measuring it, then you can't manage it. So once you know where you want to be and where you are, we know that the difference between the two is the gap. So how can we fill the gap? How can we fill the gap? Well, we can work, we can save, or we can say, how do I do this so much faster? How do I do it so much faster? So what are the three main accelerators that will help you do that? The first one is effort, right? You, know, you can, and we'll talk about specifics, you could just work harder. That doesn't sound terribly exciting, but that can accelerate. You can also say, well, I'm going to have good investments, even though I'm not exactly sure what to do right now. And then last but not least, you can say, well, I've got relationships, and I can, I can use these relationships. And so if you take all of these accelerators and you throw them into a model, then you come up with a thing that I've used for decades now that has performed throughout all of the craziness. I think we've had 47 recessions in the last 100 years. 47 recessions, what? That's crazy, right? So what works through all these things? So my model is basically, if we look at our efforts and we look at our investments and we look at our relationships and how they interact with each other, what can this do for us? Because a lot of us will focus on effort that we can use to generate income or we'll say, what can I invest in that will help me build income and or wealth? but we don't really think about how do relationships impact that? How do relationships impact that? Well, the first thing is that if you've got, if you've got good effort and you've got good investments, then that's gonna increase your return on effort, right? Because you're gonna clone little mini-me's and they're gonna be out there earning you money. And hopefully they're earning you money passively. And again, I think you have to manage everything, but that's, that's the first part. But then when you combine your investments with relationships, you're going to get more leverage because I'll tell you what, the reason that we're able to get in on deals that Andreessen Horowitz and A16 and all these uh, venture people want to get in on that are not open to the public is because of the relationships we have. I'm an advisor on a fund that invests in those kinds of things. Therefore, I have access to that. The more relationships that you make, and congratulations in being here because you're here already that says so much. And what you need to think about is how can I use this time that I've got here that I've carved out, that I've invested in myself to also get to know at least five or seven other people? Because you never know where those people are going to come from or, whether the, or where they're going to go. And those relationships can be life-changing. They have for me. Almost every great deal that I've gotten into is coming to an event like this being part of a mastermind where I was able to meet other people who were interested in the same thing that I was, or getting coaching from somebody who is a really great influence on sharing with me how to get myself back on track, right? We all need that. So when you've got great relationships and you've got investments, then you have a return on your investment that is higher than you can get other places. And then last but not least, when we have good efforts, and we've got relationships, then we get this thing called return on relationships. And that's the part that I think most people miss, especially that, because it can help you get more income because they will connect you to the people that you need to be connected to. It all really, really, really blows up in a good way when you've got good relationships. Okay, so when you've got all this stuff going for you, you've got a return on your effort You've got a high return on your investments, higher because of the relationships you've got, and you've got a high return on the relationships themselves that are then causing you to have to exert less effort. Life becomes pretty cool. Deal flow just happens. The best returning things come to you. The things that other people can't get into come to you. Very, very important. So let's talk about some accelerators for each of these things. So to accelerate your efforts, there's a few things that you can do. You can increase your output. I don't like this one because it's work more. Not really a big fan of that, okay? 
Um, you can increase your efficiency, which is work smarter. That one I like. How can I, how can I become more efficient to produce the exact same result that I am achieving right now with less work, okay? Less effort. You can increase your compensation, meaning you can raise your prices, the prices that you charge to help other people if you do. If you don't, you probably should. Um, you can basically say, well, I'm going to get income from more sources. The IRS says that the average millionaire in the United States has seven sources of income. How many do you have, right? Something, something to think about, okay? So you can charge higher prices. You can up-level your skill set. Mike said that life is like a video game in the opening keynote, right? It is. You should always be up-leveling because you know what? Just like in a video game, the people that are on the other side, right, the monsters, the orcs, the competition you've got, they're up-leveling, their armor's getting better, their health is improving, and if you don't do that to yourself, then you're going to get left behind. That's not a good thing. So if you up-level your skill set, the thing that you can do is you can provide more value to other people. Also, delegate. Again, how do you get other people to do all of the things that are the lowest return activities for you? Whether it's mowing the grass, or doing the laundry, or balancing your checkbook, any of that stuff. Outsource that. Outsource all of that low pay stuff. So here's a few return on efforts hacks for you. The first one is models. So I like this model. Would you guys agree that Warren Buffett has been moderately successful? I mean, he's, he's doing a good job, right? You know, I mean, yeah, I think he can do better, but he's, he's doing fine, right? Well, his business partner who is behind the scenes on most things, his name is Charlie Munger. Charlie says, really, the most successful people should have a lattice work of models that allow them to achieve whatever they want to achieve. So having models for success, whether it's like the models that, um, that the Wealth Accelerators folks provide in terms of uh, the trucking routes or the uh, automated uh, Walmart stores or YouTube channels or any of that kind of stuff, that's a model. The more the, of the proven successful models that you can follow, the more success you will have. The model, I was Tony, I'm a recovering attorney by the way, sorry. Um, some people say I haven't fully recovered, but one of my clients um, several years ago was Tony Robbins. And I learned from Tony, Tony said, you know, listen, if you can do the things, take the actions that successful people that have the success you want take, and you can think the thoughts that they think, then it's very likely you can replicate their success. Unless maybe it's, you know, I don't know, uh, Michael Jordan or somebody like that, right? You might have to have some innate physical skills or, or situation. But models work. So one of the big hacks to me is go find the models that work. You've got a lot of them here. You heard Brian Page talk about a great model for investing in Airbnbs, right? You heard Elena Cardone talk about a really great real estate model. And uh, you'll hear a whole lot more as well. So take notes of those models and say, which of these seem like they've had the success that I want? And then break them down and say, how do I get involved in that? How do I get to implement this model? Because if you do, it's very likely that you'll have the success. You've got to pick carefully. But once you do, it's very likely you can emulate the success of the people that you uh, are modeling. The second thing is mentors. I was really lucky in my life. I've had a few people that took me under their wing when I was going into new things. The importance of a mentor is that you get one-on-one -on -one interaction. And um, the best mentors have achieved exactly what you want to achieve. What you'll ultimately do is come into a community, which I'll talk in a, about in a minute, but find someone who has already done the thing that you want to do and find a way to work with them. Very often, mentors have created channels of access. When I was getting into investment banking and learning a little bit about finance, I had um, an investment banker on Wall Street took me under his wing. I didn't know anything about that stuff, even though I had a degree in um, accounting, right? And I had, a, I had a securities license to sell securities. I got that when I was 20 years old, right? So I knew a lot about it, but I didn't know how to be an investment banker. And I was like, those guys make money. I don't want to be a stockbroker. I want to be an investment banker. They buy companies. They do deals. I was wearing the wrong shirts. I was wearing the wrong shoes. He's like, you're never going to get into the club, you know? You're never going to be accepted as an investment banker if you're dressing like you're dressing right now. You know, I was a musician. I was like, you dress like a musician, you're going to hang out with musicians. They don't make as much money as you might want to make. I was like, okay, cool. And little things like that, like they know the code. 
They know the code. That's why mentors are so valuable. And then last but not least, it's three M's, right? Model, mentor, and then masterminds. Can you get involved with a community of your peers that is going to help elevate you? They say that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with in any topic of your life. So if you want to be wildly successful, ask yourself, how many people who are where I want to be have I met? How many people have, have you met if you're trying to get to a million? Have you met millionaires? If you're trying to get to 10 million if, you know, or 100 or a billion, how many of those people are you hanging out with and how can you get yourself connected with them? I've never found a better way to do that than a mastermind because a mastermind is a group of people that come together to share openly, to be vulnerable, to say what's working, to say what, what failed, and they're helping each other lift everybody up. So to me, those are three very, very big hacks, very significant. The other is don't get stuck on the organizational chart. Don't get stuck on the org chart. In every company, there's a list at the top is usually the CEO. Do you know what you should never aspire to be? The freaking CEO. Be the owner. The CEO has a job. The CEO has a freaking job title. It's called CEO. They have a job description of things they're supposed to do. Go look it up. If you're the CEO, you have people called direct reports. That means that you have people like the COO, the chief operating officer, the chief marketing officer, uh, all of those people who are reporting to you, and you're supposed to manage them. That's not what you should be doing. You should be the investor. You should be the investor. So Michael Gerber wrote a great book called The E-Myth. How many of you guys have read The E-Myth? A few? Okay. It's, it's something you should. Thank you for, for sharing that. It's something you should definitely read or listen to because in it, he says that most people work in the business. They open the shop. They sweep the floors. They're doing, they're wearing several hats and they're doing the work of serving the customer. And that what he says is you should really instead be working on the business. You should be systematizing, you should be delegating, you should be hiring people to do those other things. But the problem with that, and the reason I call it the O-myth, is it's, it's a myth that you should be working on the business. That's where the poor people play, right? No offense, but that's, that's it. If you're cool with that, that's great. But if you want true wealth, you want to be above the business. This is a magical time when you're no longer saying, how are we going to sell more of those widgets? How are we going to do more, uh, more volume there? This is where you say, my product or service is not the product or service that this business sells. My product or service is the business itself. That's really important. If the product or service that you think about is the business and the value of the business I will show you in a minute how you can make a whole lot of money very, very, very quickly, okay? That's the place that you want to live. The last one in the return on effort is hire or partner with or outsource contract anything that is a weakness. That's something I learned from Sarah Blakely who founded Spanx. She's done okay. Uh, or that you dislike. And nobody ever talks about that part. If you don't like doing something, you will find a way to screw it up. You'll find a way to get out of it, ignore it, it's not gonna happen. So what you wanna do is if you don't like something or if you're not particularly good at something, let somebody else do it. I personally like partnering. I don't own 100% of any business I own. I have partners that absolutely love to do the stuff that I hate. It's amazing. I'm like, how could you possibly enjoy accounting, right? You know, I love accounting, it's great. You know, okay, great, cool. I love that about you, right? Partner or hire or contract away your weaknesses. Um, the, investment, it's the investment accelerators. So how can you get a higher return on your investment? We're talking about increasing our ROI here. So Warren Buffett's rule one, don't lose money. Don't lose money. Wealth preservation, right? How do you do that? Well, you figure out how can I decrease risk? How can you decrease risk? Well, one way that I do it is I know that if I buy a business, I already have a history of what it's been doing. I'm not doing a startup, which has a 90% chance of failure. I am literally buying something that already has proven itself over the past, let's say, 10 years. 
that it makes this much money and is growing at this rate and it already has everything together. That's a big decrease in the risk because I know when I close my deal on that, as long as it's professionally managed and not owner operated, I know what return I'm gonna get. It's already set. It's to me the safest thing you could possibly do. But the compensation on it's asymmetric because people think it's super risky. But it's not, because it has a history. Monitor the fees that you're paying. If you're investing, if you're in a crypto fund or, or uh, investing in a real estate fund or something like that, how much are they charging? What's the profit that they're making off the front? What are the fees and can you manage or negotiate those? The next one would be, excuse me, would be structuring wisely. So here, how can you reduce the taxes that you pay? So if you're not careful and you live in California, you'll pay 13.3, I think it is, going up. They're, they're suggesting that that's too low, so they're going to raise it to 18. Um, you're going to pay 18 or 13 percent taxes that somebody that lives in Texas or a tax-free state is not going to pay. Now, that might change where you live, but if you ask my attorney friend, Grant Teeple, he'll tell you, why don't you just establish your structure in that place? There's a whole lot going on right now in Congress about companies like Apple and Google and Facebook that have structured their organization out of the country, like the headquarters, so that they can pay no taxes and they've got hundreds of billions of dollars sitting out there they haven't had to pay taxes on. That's pretty smart, as long as it's within the law, right? So thinking about structuring yourself so you are, re I mean, if you're paying out, probably most people are paying 30% more in combined state and federal taxes than they should be. If you can restructure yourself and the assets and investments that you hold in the proper way, that's going to be a big benefit for you. The next is be consistent, right? So this is don't panic. This is the worst time to sell. Has anybody here panic and sold and is willing to admit it ever? None of you have done that. It's shocking because the market does it all the time, right? So good for you. The other thing you can do is DCA, right? Dollar cost average. Dollar cost average. Also buy low. How do you buy low? You buy the dip and you find motivated sellers. Motivated sellers are the people who are panicking because they think the market's going to fall even further. Or they're people that own businesses that for whatever reason don't think that they want to continue to own them. Those are the people that you want to buy from because you'll get the best deals and then increase your returns by adding more value. We acquire multifamily dwellings, big apartment complexes, and then we know that we can add the value. So we buy them based on the value of where they sit today, knowing that if we just go in and put some paint on and change some carpets and maybe build a tech package and some other stuff, that we can dramatically increase the income because we can raise the rents in those places because they're significantly nicer. So we'll appeal to people who are willing to pay more. When we acquire a company, I know in advance that I can go in and say, this company hasn't raised its prices in the last three years. Amazingly simple solution. Most businesses don't think to raise their prices. I know we're all saying, well, a lot of them have lately, but still a lot of companies, that, especially ones that are owned by baby boomers that they've had for 10, 20, 30 years, they just, hadn't, they just didn't think to raise prices or they didn't feel good about it. So adding additional value. So a couple of hacks here. One is exiting a company. So how can you get years of income in a single year? Most companies sell for a multiple of their profits, a multiple of profits. So let's say that a business sells for well, I'll show you in a minute, but like to private equity, businesses right now are selling for an average of 15 years profits. That means that today, when you sell your company to private equity, you just got paid 15 years of profits. What if you could exit a company every year? What if you could exit a company every five years? Then every five years, you'd have an extra 15 years of income that your counterpart that didn't do that did not have. To me, this is really important really, really game changer for you. If you can get a company that you can sell, and let's say the multiple is 15, because that's the current private equity multiple. If you can sell that company in five years, and most private equity companies like to sell within three to five, some of them have longer time horizons. That means over 20 years, you would, you would have exited four times. Four times 15, is 60, meaning that over that 20 years, you would have achieved 60 years of income plus the 20 years of income you got. 
effectively you would have 80 years of income, somebody that held on to that company would have 20. That's a game changer. That's a game changer. I exit on average about four companies a year. So think about that. So in one year, I'm 60 years ahead. In one year out of 10, I'm 40 years ahead of the person who's not doing that. That's a big deal. So take a look at it on the chart because if you were to buy and hold and receive a 7% average increase in income on a business and you were to hold it for 16 years, at the end of the day, you would have about $9.6 million you would be walking away with. But if instead you did what I just said and you exited every three to five years, same deal, same return, same exit multiple, you walk with 26 million six. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Acquiring businesses for no money out of pocket, how can it be done? I do it all the time. Let's talk about it, uh, how you do that. There are three crises that are going on that really make this possible right now. Baby boomers are aging out. There's about 50 million baby boomers that are retiring over the next 10 years. 12 million of those own businesses. That means that there are 4.5 million businesses that are going to transition ownership worth about $10 trillion over the next decade. Lots and lots of people because you know what? These baby boomers have successful businesses that are boring, like car washes and you know, small SaaS companies and things like that. And their kids are going to be Instagram influencers. They don't want to run a car wash. That's not good for the gram, right? <laughs> Car wash, yay, no. So the problem is that there's an overcapacity then of these people who want to sell their businesses but can't. In fact, only 20% of the businesses that are listed for sale actually end up selling. That means that 80% of the people that would like to sell a business can't. Now, a lot of those people move into this crisis three and they just close the business. And on top of that, a lot of businesses simply fail. Every year, six and a half million businesses start up, 1.6 million fail, right? In fact, 90% fail over the first 10 years that they're in business. So that means only 10% of businesses survive the first. And no matter how smart you are, no matter how smart you are, you still have a pretty high failure rate. The, the people in Silicon Valley, with all the attorneys and investment bankers and everything, they fail 75% of the time. People who have a successful track record of opening and having a business be successful still fail 70% of the time. I don't like those odds. Do you want to fail 70, 75%, 90% of the time? Or do you want to just go and maybe buy the businesses that already got through all that, that have been around, and have a 90% chance of success? That's a pretty big swing. So you want an unfair advantage, acquire a business that already has gone through those challenges. Why do they shut down? There's a lot of reasons. They're not bad businesses. A lot of people say, well, they shut down because of money because they're not making any. Not true. A lot of the businesses that close or can't be sold are very profitable, but maybe the money isn't enough to motivate that entrepreneur to keep being in the business because they've already made their lick. They're already good. I've got partners. It's very frustrating for me. I've got partners that'll tell you, Man, I'm good. I'm already rich. I don't need any more money. I don't even understand what they're saying. Right? What the hell are you talking about? So, uh, why would you buy versus a startup? Less risk. More financing options, about 220 for acquiring a business versus about 10 for not. They already have recognized brands. They already have customers and sales and profits and employees and systems and suppliers and all the things that a business needs to run, that if you were going to start one from scratch, you would have to figure out, which is why 90% of them fail. In fact, 600,000 roughly businesses every single year just shut their doors, right? And I mentioned money as one of the reasons, but there's a lot of others, right? There's relocation, retirement, health, death, challenges that they might have with partners. Maybe they're going to get divorced. Maybe they suffer as I do from shiny object syndrome. That business looks good. My business that's making money is boring as hell. But that business that's probably in all kinds of trouble, that looks interesting, right? Health, divorce, all of these are good reasons that people might want to sell. Now, these are your motivated sellers. These are where the best deals are going to come from. 
These are why you can do deals with no money out of pocket. Also, the market is pretty giant. At any given time, in the United States, there's about 2.1 million businesses that are for sale that could not sell. They want to sell, but they couldn't. I don't know how many people are in this room, but that's a lot of businesses that each of you can buy without ever falling over each other, okay? There's truly an unlimited, untapped opportunity here. If you're expanding an existing business, there's lots of things you can do. I use a thing called the acquisition wheel. So how many of you own businesses? Okay, awesome, great. So if you, wanna, if you want to grow that business, and what I do when I go in and I acquire a business first is I go through this thing. I say, what do you need? What do we need to solve for? The acquisition wheel will tell us. Do you need more customers? Well, if I need more customers, I can just acquire competitors. That's going to get me market share faster. Do you need more leads? Yeah, I'd like to have more leads. That's really our problem. We'd, everything would be great if we had more leads. Fine, let's go buy media. Media is where somebody else has already aggregated the attention and eyeballs of our ideal customer. If I buy that media, Casey was just telling me that he's acquired... I think he said 10, um, but it might have been more, meetup groups. And from that, he fills all of his events because he has unlimited leads. He found people that had already aggregated the attention and eyeballs of his ideal customer. We buy Facebook groups. We buy LinkedIn groups. We buy Instagram uh, accounts. We buy YouTube channels. We buy podcasts. If you want to have increased capability, and hopefully this is going to go, well, I'm, afraid, I'm, a, I'm afraid to touch it, but I'm going to do it, okay. Uh, if you want increased infrastructure, increased capability, you need teams that you don't have right now, then you can do something called aqua hiring. You go find somebody else that's already got the team that you want, that's already got the sales force you want, the dev team, whatever it is that you're missing in your business, and you acquire that business to acquire that team or those resources. Maybe they've got great SOPs that you don't have and you would like to have then that's how you do that. Maybe you need higher average order value. You want each transaction that a customer has with you to be for a greater amount of money. Great, you need more products and services to offer them. So you go and acquire products and services. And these can be assets or whole companies. Maybe you want more lifetime customer value. Well, one of the easiest ways to do that is to identify companies that have recurring revenue, monthly or annual recurring revenue. So the auto ship, the lawn, mower, uh, the lawn care maintenance contract, the computer service agreement, all of those things, right? That'll get you higher lifetime customer value. Maybe you need more profit. Well, then just acquire up and down the supply and distribution chain. That's called vertical integration in the investment banking world. Let's just buy the people that we're already paying a profit to to make the things that we sell to somebody else. Or let's buy our affiliates or our distributors that are making Profit when they sell our stuff. Let's just go DTC, direct to consumer. Or maybe you need more innovative products. Maybe it's like, well, man, you know, our products have been around for 30 years. They're kind of tired and old. So I can acquire a company that has all the customers and everything together but doesn't have new cool stuff to sell them. Go acquire some intellectual property because a lot of inventors are not really great business people and don't want to start a business. So you get to help them by acquiring their intellectual property. They start getting a royalty, and you've got instant, new, amazing, high-tech products for your people to buy. So that's a great way to do that, too. Okay, so that's how we do it. There's a, there's a sheet to do it if you want to take a picture of it. I would recommend that you use this to improve your business. And um, if you want, that's the blank one. And if you want, I filled it out for you with all the things you can buy. Right? These are all the types of things that you can buy. In media, you can buy Facebook accounts, email accounts, radio and TV shows, podcasts, all that. Teams, companies that are software development companies, products or services. The thing to remember there is the very first listing is BDA, products and services. What are the products and services your customers are buying before, during, and after the time they buy from you? You can buy auto ship products. You can buy Facebook stores or uh, Etsy stores, there's all kinds of things you can buy. Patents, copyrights, trademarks, all of these things can add on to your business. And we've done this time after time. We bought a company called True Conversion to get the software development team because we'd never put together a software development team. We acquired all these other companies to add these other products and services. It works very well. And then you can monetize in several ways, right? And I'm not going to go through the, the math on it because Somebody said they were promised there would be no math. So um, I am going to say that if you were to acquire 
a company, the better the multiple that you acquire at, the more profit you can make. So if you were to, to do a good deal, maybe the company's making 400000 in profit. If you could purchase it at a multiple of four, and it's worth a multiple of five because it's a motivated seller, you pick up $400,000 in equity instantly, just like that. And the better you buy, the more profit you can get. And our target is typically to acquire it a 1x. That's a lot of money that's built into your profit right off the bat. The second thing you can do is you get cash from operations. So you think about what does it cost to own the company versus what is it making? In this case, the same company in those three deals was making 400000 of profit. But if I finance it over 10 years with no interest, which I've done multiple times and you can, my net cash flow would be 240000 positive cash flow, $20,000 a month the day that I close the deal. If I did the better deal, it's 320000 And if I did the best deal, then it's $30,000 a month. So now I've got my built-in profit from the first thing plus operating cash on cash cash flow, right? which effectively gives me an infinite return because I'm not paying anything to acquire these businesses, okay? Strategy three, cash out with an exit. As I mentioned, businesses sell. There's about $5 trillion sitting in cash on the sidelines in private equity funds, in SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies, in corporations to acquire, and they can't find enough deals. So if we can bring them deals, if we acquire at the low end, and these are numbers that come from various resources, which I cite at the bottom, because this is all data. The average owner-operated company sells for a multiple of 2.5 times across all industries. Is it different for SaaS and different for a lawnmower company? Yes, but the average is 2.5. The average professionally managed company, meaning that you don't need the owner to operate it. If the owner was not there, it would continue to go on and be profitable, sells at 4.5. When they sell to private equity, when the income gets to about $2 million and sales get to about $10 million, these private equity companies and big companies and SPACs and family offices come in and they want to buy them, but there's so many of them competing to buy them, they have to pay an average of about 15 times. And why would they do that? Because then they're just going to take them public and that's trading at about 27 times. Everybody wins, maybe except the last person in the retail investor, right? Sometimes they win too, okay? But this is guaranteed winning. This is the odds are in your favor winning. So then how do you do this? How do you acquire these companies without having to pay anything in cash? Well, I'm going to give you five ways now. And if you watch my case studies, which we'll end with, you'll see that there are several others. But um, for zero out of pocket, I like carve outs. We have 221 ways now. I like carve outs. Carve out just says, hey, you've got some assets that I don't need. Let's just take those out of the company and then we'll pay less. We'll lower the purchase price correspondingly. Cool, cool, great. Lots of people, especially solopreneurs and people who have those owner-operated and smaller under 10 million businesses have all kinds of assets that they bought in the name of the company that you might not want and they don't insist that you take to sell because most of them can't sell anyway. Excuse me. And uh, revenue-based financing. So I love revenue-based financing. We use this pretty regularly. This is where you can go out and get a loan against the future revenue of the company because the company's been earning revenue for a long time. So it's been making money and earning sales for a long time. People like American Express or Lighter will actually loan you money based on the probability that that money will continue to come in. And they're loaned at very favorable rates. We'll typically borrow from Amex at about six. So we can go into a company that hasn't thought about doing this and find the money to pay for it to buy it just by going out and getting a revenue-based financing loan. The other thing we can do, I keep hitting the button forward, sorry. The other thing we do is we ask the seller, hey, you hadn't been able to sell this thing for forever. If you want to sell it and get the price, I'm happy to give you your price if you give me terms, meaning that you're going to sell or finance this, or what we call owner carry. Great. That's another way. Another way is to do a thing called integrator equity. There's a very good chance that the person who is selling the company has all of the equity, but has people who are managing the company who have no equity, but would like to. So if we give those people the opportunity to buy some of the equity of the company, let's say we need 20% cash down, but we don't want to come out of pocket 20%. Well, if we go to the manager and the marketing director and the head of operations and we say, hey, how would you like to have a chance to come in and own part of this company? 
we're going to make 20% of it available to you guys. They then hit their IRAs, their crypto accounts, their savings, their friends and family, their house, all of those things to come up with the money to buy into the company. Now they're going to stay forever. They're going to work three times as hard, and you just got your 20% down payment, and 80% of it's probably being carried back by the seller, or one of these other things. Like I said, to me, they stack like Legos. Or you do an earnout. An earnout says, you want this much for the company because you say it's going to perform like this. I'm not sure it is, but I'm willing to take your word for it. And therefore, if it does over the next two, three, four years hit the numbers you say it's going to hit, then I'll pay you the extra money. That's an earnout. So all of these just stack on top of each other to make it possible to acquire these companies without having to spend any money. I don't need any money. I've had so much cash just sitting around waiting to be able to spend some, but we keep finding ways to acquire these companies with no money out of pocket. It's kind of frustrating, right? 125, a couple of uh, examples for you. So this is a Facebook group that we bought. This was a real estate-based Facebook group. We typically only pay one year's profit on a Facebook group, and usually they're not making much profit. This one had not had any profit, but it, I own a real estate brokerage, and each real estate agent that comes to us is worth quite a bit of money, and this was the second largest Facebook group. We tried to buy the first one, we couldn't, but we did strategically partner with it. So we bought it. It had 53,000 members at the time. They were asking 125K. We agreed on 75,000. How are we going to pay for that? We did revenue-based financing. Kind of reverse revenue-based financing because we said the first money that comes in, we're going to give 100% of that to you. How's that sound? Great. So then we went out and we sold a sponsorship. Sponsorships are magical because they get paid every year. They're so much better than investors because you don't have to give away ownership in the company. You don't get somebody else that has voting rights. You get the money now, and you get it next year and next year and next year and next year. Investor, you get it one time, right? So we sold a sponsorship to a mortgage brokerage that wanted exclusive rights for 12 months to access this group of 53,000 realtors to hopefully do loans, right? They said, cool, they gave us 50 grand. Then we went to a real estate agent training company. We don't care about that either. And we said, how about a sponsorship for 20 grand? They said, great. So we instantly had $70,000. Then... The person that brought us the deal said, well, I'd like to put some money in just so I can say I did a deal with you guys. We said, fine. And we were 2,500 short. And because we don't like to lose our game that we play of no money out of pocket, we did a credit card advance for the 2,500 bucks just so we could make it no money out of pocket. Okay? We wanted to make it happen. <laughs> Thank you. Two more. $300,000 SaaS, software as a service. This was a company that was a customer of ours. Our employee, one of our employees brought it to us. We agreed on a $100,000 purchase price. We did straight seller financing for nine months. I bought it because I had another company that had a whole bunch of people that I knew would buy this service. And so we basically just said, hey, can we give you the down payment about a week after we close? We sent one email and we made $30,000. So we gave them the $10,000 down payment and then built it, built it up from there. 10,000 a month because we knew that we knew we already had a, an audience. So you can start mixing and matching and doing deals with the companies that you own to make this stuff happen. And this one is my favorite kind of deal to do because you get to put cash in your pocket too. So $3 million publishing house was earning 1.3 million in profits. They were asking 3.9 million. We ended up agreeing on an acquisition price of $2 million. That was one and a half times deal. I got owner carry for three years at no interest for 80% of that. So that's 1.6 million financed. The remaining 400000 I went to one of my neighbors who was saying, I can't get anything on my money. I hate it. I'm getting like 1% on my money. I said, tell you what, how about if I give you 10 times that on an interest-only loan for three years? He said, that would be amazing. I said, cool, I got you. Then I went to my banker, one of my bankers and one of the accountants that I work with who had been saying, I want to do a deal. And I said, okay, cool, I've got one. I sold them 20% at the company, but not at my 1.5 valuation. I sold it at market value, which was three. So I got $800,000 from them. I paid off my buddy the $400,000. Remember, he was going to get paid off in three years. I gave him $40,000 in cash to say, here's a year's worth of interest for being able to use your money for about 30 days. How happy was he? How many people did he say, man, I did a great deal. I got paid effectively 120% on my money because it was 10% for only a month. 
And then I put $360,000 in my pocket. Now, I did only own 80% of the business after that, but I got two super great employees who had significant skin in the game. This is how you do no money out of pocket, okay? And I'm going to rush through the, uh, I'm going to ask your permission. I can stop here, I'm out of time, or I can give you the last bits through the relationship accelerators, but I'll be quick. Go? Okay. All right. So relationship accelerators. The way that you do that is, how can I solve problems? You ask, how can I help? Every single person, the last thing I say is, how can I help? What can I do for you? Make connections. Introduce people to your networks. Do it immediately. Text people together. The value that you will add is just so huge, and people will remember that. Add value. Offer improvement to anybody that you meet, even if they're not asking for it. Just here's what I can do to make this better. Be present. Touch base often and listen to what people say. Give always and expect nothing, but much will come in return. Sometimes it won't, but must, much it will. And let them help you when they ask, can I help you? Be strategic about your asks, right? So to me, the, the hack for this is consulting for equity. So consulting for equity is where you basically say, I'm going to provide some really good value for you, and I'm going to create a recurring revenue stream that builds wealth. All I need for that is positioning. You don't want to be the help. You can't hire me. You can't hire me. I am a, one who provides genius, not one who is the help, okay? Pricing is a fee into equity. I charge 25 grand for four hours. I've done about 100 of those in the past two years, and about one in four of those turns into an equity deal. So I'm getting paid to vet deals. Pretty cool. And you can do that too. Um, and then deliver a framework-based solution. So what you learn from me and Brian and Elena and all of the brilliant people that Mike works with here and all the people you'll hear tomorrow, those are frameworks. All you have to do is say, I need to understand that framework. I can share that with somebody else and you can be compensated for it. Um, so, so take your genius inventory. I'm going to put this up for you to take a picture of. This is... There we go. This is what you want to do is inventory your experiences that you've got, the skills and superpowers that you have, the things that you like, that you're actually passionate about, and your network. And then use that to decide what you're going to help people with in exchange for receiving equity in their company. Okay? What are their biggest common pain points? And then I'm going to get to the part where... Uh, What can you consult on? Almost anything you can think of. You all have skills that are so valuable that you don't realize how valuable they are to other people because it's common sense and common knowledge to you. But it will be life-changing and revelatory to other people, okay? Clients that you may already have, how many of you have had somebody say, can I pick your brain in the last 90 days? You have built-in clients. I used to hate that. I was like, you want to pick my brain? That sounds painful. It should probably be illegal. I don't know. But now I'm excited about it because it, it basically, I reply with, hey, the way I do that is a half day, four hour consultation. It's $25,000, blah, 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 blah. Filters out all the people that aren't willing to invest in themselves because you, you only want to deal with people who will invest in themselves, right? And now you've got people who've got skin in the game. They're more likely to listen to you and it's more likely to lead to a deal. So if they're asking, can I ask you a question, or can I give you equity in my company, or do you have a minute, that's the answer, right? And you can do all kinds of deals. You can do, and I'm just going to go off the slides here so I can do it fast. You can do advisory deals where you go and you say, I'm going to give you advice. And typically you're going to get a little bit of equity for that, maybe a quarter of a point, maybe 5%, depends on the size of the company. You can also do operational deals where you go in and you say, I've got a skill. I'm good at marketing. I'm good at investing. I'm good at acquiring companies. I'm good at whatever you're good at. And get anywhere typically from 10 to 60% or more of the company for doing that. I can't tell you how many times I've received 20, 40, 60% of a company just because I could go in and solve a problem that they had. Most entrepreneurs are leaving, leading lives of quiet desperation and they're really having challenges with something and they're alone. And if you can solve that problem and relate to them and be a partner, they will give equity in their company to be able to have you do that. You can do transactional consulting where you're good at any one particular transaction. I do it for exits. When somebody wants to sell a company, I take a piece of the company to exit 
Meaning I didn't have to build the whole daggone company up or go through that 90% failure rate. I get to come in at the moment that the best thing in the world is going to happen. They're going to sell and get paid. And I get a piece of that, right, to help them do that. You can do it for pretty much anything. So what I would just say is if you want to accelerate your wealth, think about the investments, the effort, and the relationships model. And what are the things that you can do to accelerate each of those things because they will in turn move you to great wealth faster. And never, never, never forget that exit. That exit thing is like if you remember only one thing from here, to get paid years and years of income in a single moment multiple times a year is pretty daggone exciting. Get the model, get the mastermind community to support you and find a good mentor and you're gonna do great. Thank you so much. If you want a lot of additional really cool stuff, I've got a whole channel full of it and you should subscribe so that you don't miss any of it. I'm uploading videos all the time. There's a lot of things that are changing in this area and you don't wanna miss out. You don't wanna do it wrong and you don't wanna make the mistakes I made. Subscribe so that you don't miss out and then check out this next video.